You know what? Today I woke up and said to myself, Mark, you've been too happy lately reviewing all of Dragon Ball Z. And you know what? I'm right. I should listen to myself more. Since starting this channel, I've covered all of Dragon Ball. From the classic material to Dragon Ball Z, from the films to Dragon Ball Super and Dragon Ball GT. I've even covered Super Dragon Ball Heroes, would you believe? <laughs> oh my! Yeah, I know. I thought by saving Dragon Ball Z for the finale, I was saving the best for last, but as it turns out, I've neglected one glaring part of the wider series, the filler. But here's the fun part. I have actually somehow never seen any of this, ever. Though I've watched the Dragon Ball Z anime in its entirety many times over, I've never seen any of Dragon Ball's filler episodes until now. There are 20 episodes of straight concentrated filler for me to hook into my veins. That's a little over seven hours of bullshit. Sweet, sweet Dragon Ball nectar for me to devour and review for your viewing pleasure. And you wanna know the best part? That's just classic Dragon Ball. Z has way more, way more, like so much more. So sit back and relax as I force myself to wade through the filler of Dragon Ball's past in search of a diamond hidden amidst the rough. So first things first, I'm a realist. Glad we got that cleared up. Second thing is we gotta define what constitutes filler for this video. Filler in a general sense refers to anime only material not present in the manga. And it comes in two forms generally. Content separate from the main story and content that elongates the canon material. Dragon Ball as a whole is chock full of the latter. And let me tell you, you do not want me to sit here and talk about the extra four hours of Goku staring at Frieza. So stuff like that and Goku being chased through Penguin Village are off the cards unfortunately. That was take a psychotic amount of time and quite frankly you can't make me so instead we're diving into the proper dedicated stuff to see whether it's great and truly feels like dragon ball to be fair to the writers tasked with creating filler episodes i think they have a rather narrow margin for error to work within most of what I'll be covering today will be collections of filler episodes nestled between canon arcs, meaning they are forced to begin after a particular event with specific conditions, and even more restricting, they are forced to conclude with the continuation of the canon story. This creates difficult challenges for the filler to overcome. Number one, if the writers get too creative or ambitious with their vision for these mini arcs slash episodes, then they run the risk of confusing or derailing the main story, which is not good. And number two, if they play things too safe, they become oppressively boring. Uh, my least favorite thing in this story. So truth be told, if I can find even one or two episodes that impress me here, I'll consider this a roaring success. So let's find that gold. Filler Arc 1, episodes 30 to 33, which I will call henceforth the uninspired start. This first collection of episodes finds its placement following Goku's defeat at the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai. In the manga's continuity, following the tournament, Goku embarks on a journey to reclaim his grandpa's four-star Dragon Ball, and along the way, he encounters the Red Ribbon Army. But in this, following the tournament, Goku embarks on a journey to reclaim his grandpa's four-star Dragon Ball, and along the way, he encounters the Red Ribbon Army and the Pilaf Gang. I can smell the Oscar nominations already. Jokes aside, there are elements to this story that I did enjoy. If you're the sort of person that likes guns shooting and planes fighting in Dragon Ball, I don't think any other part of the series has you covered this extensively. And it's funny, I always thought that there was a lot of that sort of thing in the Dragon Ball movies, but here I am finding out that Toy's obsession with planes and dogfights starts even earlier than that. Furthermore, it's kind of cute that we get to see where and how the Red Ribbon Army found and obtained the Dragon Balls they had during the Red Ribbon Army arc. That sort of added context is fun, but it did have its trappings, which regrettably I found very boring before long. I suppose, however, it depends on how you like your Dragon Ball. Personally, while I did enjoy the Red Ribbon Army arc overall, I wasn't a massive fan of the Army vs Goku dynamic, and this filler prelude just felt like an extended version of that with a sprinkling of peel off. The overarching plot of these episodes sees Goku and the two separate villainous parties vying for whatever Dragon Ball props up, with each individual arc offering up a chance for misadventures. The first brings them into contact with a young thief that smells bad. In the second, we reunite with Chi Chi and Ox King for Goku's supposed wedding. The third offers some cool action and militaristic animations akin to Gundam. But something that I did start to think about was something I had heard written about Dragon Ball long ago. 
Following the conclusion of Dragon Ball's first arc, sales of the manga hit a bit of a lull, so to speak. There was a sense that perhaps now that the Dragon Balls had been gathered and the wish made on the dragon, the general public figured they'd seen the story's one trick, that there was no more to see. And that's when Toriyama hit the masses with the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai, an arc entirely different to that which came before. And the same can be said for the Red Ribbon Army arc that follows it. Dragon Ball's greatest strength early on was its versatility and ability to offer something new at every turn. You never knew where it was going, and I think that's what this filler arc was lacking for me. It felt like a retread of plot elements or an incorporation of story elements that felt like they were taken from the first arc mixed with a flavor of what's to come. In other words, it felt too much like what we've already seen, not helped by bringing back the peel-off trio as prominent antagonists rather than the bit players they ultimately play later. I will say, however, that while the first three episodes play it too safe, the fourth decides to confidently expand on the deep lore of the series unabashedly. Perhaps you know, too confidently. Uh, suddenly, the story shifts from what's going on with Goku and we're following Krillin training on Roshi's Island. In it, Roshi starts to explain the history of the Dragon Balls. Now, remember, this isn't canon. This isn't written by Akira Toriyama. And I love how, on one hand, this mini arc takes no chances in terms of plot, but then out of nowhere throws a Hail Mary all caution to the wind and tries to give an origin to the orbs that literally define this series. It's in the name. I gotta look up who wrote this, one second. But before we move on to the next stage of this thunderous war through the trenches of Dragon Ball filler, it's time to talk about our sponsor for today's video, War Thunder. Available on PlayStation, Xbox, PC, and Mac, this huge multiplayer sees you embark on a series of epic confrontations across ground, sea, and air, packed full of renowned and prototype vehicles, and best of all, it's free to play. This game is crazy intense on the audio-visual front, but where it really shines is in its mechanics. There are no health bars on vehicles. You gotta get creative here. Wanna take down a tank? Gotta mess up its tracks. Wanna yeet a plane out of the sky? You gotta shoot the fuel tank. It offers some crazy flexibility. You can even customize those very modules. Protect yourself with smoke grenades and dynamic armor just to name but a few. But know that no matter what you operate, it's gonna feel unique. There are vehicles from the 20th century right through to the present day. You can dress them up and go crazy with recon drones and nuclear strikes that obliterate the map. It's nuts. Blowing up buildings, leaving craters in the earth, it's all in the name of creating cover. Whether you're in the forest, the desert, or the snowy mountains, these dynamic features make battles feel fresh. And that's the key here. The latest update, Sons of Attila, just added a whole new series of unique Hungarian ground vehicles, along with immersive voiced warnings and neat graphical improvements. How's that for fresh? So, if you're brand new to War Thunder or simply haven't played in half a year or more, you can click the link in the description and get some sick bonuses. Three premium vehicles for free, a week of premium account features, and perhaps best of all, you can rent out the P-40 E-1 aircraft and the M4 tank all with unique skins. You'll even get the Eagle of Valor special decorator and 100,000 silver lions. It's crazy, but be sure to be quick because this American vehicle bonus season ends very soon. So this episode was it's called The Legend of the Legend of the Dragon and it's written by Toshiki Ino. I, f I feel like I've heard that name somewhere. Uh, yeah, massive balls on this guy. The biggest testicles in Toei. And hilariously, after about 35 years, this filler material actually ended up getting some things right. Completely by accident now. But Roshi literally says that the Dragon Balls used to be one big ball. Which, as it's presented in the episode, is totally wrong. But if we take his words at face value, it's kind of funny how the Namekian Dragon Balls were taken from the original Super Dragon Balls. I suppose a broken clock is right twice a day, but even that more ambitious episode just sort of ends abruptly in an effort to rejoin the mainline continuity. Anyways, I'd give this material a 5 out of 10. It's inoffensive, but a little boring. Next, Husky and the Amusement Park. Unlike every other section I'll be covering in this video, which boasts numerous episode-long chunks, this is the only standalone filler episode to speak of. 
Goku travels to Bulma's place. This episode therefore takes place right after they meet and before they leave together to continue their adventure, effectively extending the in-story continuity by a single day in order to allow time for some fun at this futuristic amusement park. One thing I will say about this episode is that it's got a lot more going for it than what I just covered in the prior filler. We've got a unique location at this futurist funfair. We've got a brand new anime only villain in the blonde femme fatale slash thief in Husky. And there are plenty of other character moments I found endearing like Goku reacting to an escalator for the very first time. Husky is essentially a force that's trying to get the Dragon Balls in this episode, but the way she does so is very, I don't know, uniquely sleuthy. There's an element of deception and underhandedness that's less commonly seen with a finesse that's rather entertaining, one that results in a very funny gag. Through pretending to be a psychic, she asks Goku about the two balls in his possession, to which he responds by doing... Outstanding stuff. It's a much more fun episode than the last, but nothing too exciting as it didn't have enough time. It's a pleasant experience, a 6.5 out of 10 I think is fair, but we're trending upwards. Next, the solo training arc. These five episodes have a unique opportunity. Unlike the prior episodes I've discussed, while this arc is nestled between two canon stories, the Red Ribbon Army arc and the 22nd Tenkaichi Budokai, this filler takes place during a canon training stint that went unseen in the manga. Where the manga often would leave these training stints as time skips, the anime filler saw a gap to fill and took advantage of it, placing episodes in this previously mysterious stretch of training leading up to the tournament obviously gives them a lot of wiggle room, which makes it a lot easier on the writing team at Toei to tell a compelling story that teaches Goku some valuable lessons before he arrives at that very tournament. So do they do that? Not really. Okay, I'm being a little harsh when I say that, but this arc does fall into a lot of the same trappings that plague the very first filler arc of this series feeling distinctly monster of the week in its approach. We see Goku travel far and wide while walking on his hands no less through forests and mountain ranges as he encounters unique challenges along the way. My main issue with this collection of episodes is that the connective tissue between them feels like a background element begrudgingly placed there. The canon element, and in my opinion the most interesting element of this material is that Goku is sent to train around the world to build upon the teachings he learned and discover some new ones. And while he sort of does that, very little of what is being shown here demonstrates any progression towards that goal. Instead, we spend around two hours following the misadventures Goku gets up to and that's kind of disappointing. It's a bummer because this stretch of filler is placed, in my opinion, a lot smarter than what came before. Choosing to fill an existing established gap in the story rather than chisel out your own nonsense is a much more natural way to squeeze more runtime and plot out of an existing series. The problem, of course, is that lack of cohesion from episode to episode that really messes things up. I think the main problem here, however, is the difference in how these stories are being written. Dragon Ball the manga was written by one person, Akira Toriyama. He dictates what the story is, how it goes, etc. However, the anime is a TV show. That's a very different environment. You have a whole host of writers, directors, and so on, each tasked with writing how any given episode goes. And the key difference here is that the writer on one episode is almost always different to the writer on the next. So while the anime staff obviously coordinate the overarching story of a given filler arc, that coordination is not really guaranteed, especially when the production schedule is tight. Tight, 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 yeah! However, I will say that thankfully these episodes are a lot more adventurous than the prior outings. The first episode shows Goku trying to save a town from a couple of strong biker types armed with a stunningly powerful gourd that sucks in those that don't respond to a roll call. That is hilariously specific, and this one in particular felt very fun, light, and fittingly magical. The closest, however, we get to Goku actually getting to learn some martial arts comes from the second episode where he faces off against an old master called Taiken. It's unfortunately a little on the boring side, and hilariously, the only thing that can bring back legitimacy to this sick man's struggling dojo is Goku. A martial artist that has nothing to do with that school, a fighter chosen because all the other pupils in this guy's school either suck too bad or straight up left. So. It's a weird one for sure, and a little confusing in its messaging. And then of course we have Ten Shinhan setting a purple pig on fire. Really, it's fun for the whole family, just not me. I like this arc more than the first set of episodes, but not by much. Six out of ten, next. 
the Heavenly Training Arc. This training arc is awesome. And it is by far the best filler I've seen from early Dragon Ball so far. And what's more is, it has an episode I might actually go back and watch again from time to time, which might make this episode in question my favorite filler episode in the series. Though, that still remains to be seen. Taking place during the time skip between the end of the King Piccolo arc and the 23rd Tenkai Ichi Budokai, this arc explores the training Goku undergoes with Mr. Popo in one of the most criminally unexplored areas in the Dragon Ball mythos, The Lookout. The weaker points of this mini-arc are akin to some of the best from the prior, however, even within those moments of similarity, it finds time to grant some exposition and story to the supporting characters of Krillin, Yamcha, Chaozu, and Ten Shinhan as they prepare for the upcoming World Tournament themselves. Not to mention a wonderfully entertaining time travel episode where Goku meets Master Roshi as a young man. Once again, the anime filler is set up for success here by choosing to fill an established gap in the story. And this time around, it manages to be a lot more cohesive due to the strong focus on Popo's training specifically. Where prior training arcs concerned themselves with random adventures with the backdrop being Goku's training, this arc keeps the training right at the forefront of the plot. With Popo tasking Goku with simply catching him or learning specific lessons from the distant past to help Goku develop as a warrior, it's all really compelling stuff that connects Goku to the concept of Ki more intrinsically as well as his additional senses. But my favorite episode of this arc has to be episode 130, entitled Goku's Opponent is... Goku? This episode was written by Hajime Satsuki and directed by Mitsuo Hashimoto. The concept of the episode is simple and the lesson compelling. Goku has to learn how to get out of his own way, maximize his efforts, and become a more efficient fighter. To push Goku, Popo takes one of his hairs and creates a clay doll in the form of Goku, an entity that is equal to him in every way physically, with the only discernible difference being the mindset implemented. I loved this episode for the animation, the choreography, and the stunning direction towards the end. It's honestly terrific stuff as the sun sets and Goku gets pushed back towards the edge of the lookout by this doppelganger dummy. Reminding me that this is a version of Goku that cannot yet fly and could in fact die if he were to fall from here. The views are stunningly beautiful and the conclusion somber. It's by far my favorite episode in this mini arc and pending some time to sit on it, might be my favorite filler material in all of Dragon Ball's other series too. Overall, the arc itself is strong and I think I'd watch it again. As filler goes, it's some of the best. It takes the strong approach of the previous filler training arc and tidies up a lot of its disarray with a more focused focal point. It very much felt like we were following a compelling story of self-discovery for Goku, one that fell true to the warrior that eventually arrives at the 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai later. I'd love a full arc covering the years spent here training with Popo. It was awesome, and I think we found our diamond in the rough. 8.5 out of 10. The Wedding Dress Arc. Right out of the fire and into the fry pan. <laughs> I'm very funny. But the obvious aside, we are finally at the last filler episode of the original Dragon Ball anime. And I want to say that while this filler arc doesn't possess the highs of the prior, on average, it's much more consistently enjoyable across the board. In addition to that, this arc enjoys a freedom no other filler in this series to this point has had. An open ending opportunity. This arc sits right after the last chapter of Dragon Ball's early material before the Saiyan Saga commences in the first arc of Z. Which means that unlike the last chapters which had to see Goku arrive at a particular point in time, this arc is allowed to tell its own story with a beginning, middle, and most importantly, an end. A climactic ending that's both emotional and fun. While episodic in nature to an extent, much like the prior arc which had Goku's heavenly training as the vehicle for interesting stories and scenes, this arc uses Goku and Chi Chi's impending wedding and Ox King as the motivating conditions that cause this magical adventure to unfold. Ox King is trapped in his palace with his late wife's dress for Chi Chi to wear. He's protecting it for her, but is trapped in the tower surrounded by flames. Unlike more conventional stories of the time which saw a damsel in distress trapped in a tower, Goku needs to save his soon-to-be father-in-law with the help of the capable Chi-Chi. The flames seem to be magical and cannot be put out easily, and so a quest slash scavenger hunt for the Basho Sen, or some magical fan thing, commences that takes them quite literally all over the world as they reunite with a host of familiar faces from Dragon Ball's history. 
Baba, Ox King, Chi Chi, Oolong's Village, Turtle, the Pilaf Gang, obviously, and even his grandpa Gohan at the very end. It all feels like a wonderful celebration of Dragon Ball's characters and world. From volcanoes to snowy peaks to lake beds to the door to hell itself. It holds nothing back conceptually and has a lot of fun doing so. All the while, Chi Chi and Goku's relationship is explored. Of these five episodes, I particularly enjoyed episode 152, where they follow the treacherous path to the furnace. With this journey being one Goku is carrying out to save his father-in-law, the bond and trust Goku and Chi-Chi have for each other saw them to the end of this path safely. It's honestly kind of nice. The illusions or obstacles on this trail appeared as physical manifestations of their own growing fear in these circumstances, first appearing when Chi-Chi was nervous to jump the gap. The only way forward was to face fear unflinchingly and Chi-Chi trusted Goku unconditionally in the end. Their bond for each other was quite literally strong enough to see them to the end safely. It's really sweet. But probably the funniest aspect of this arc has to be the five straight episodes and God knows how many real time hours or days in the story. Ox King is running frantically around his palace away from these seemingly sentient flames. It's a little ridiculous, but in the end, very enjoyable. This arc even has its own little final battle of sorts against the Pyre Keeper with some really cool animation too. I might not watch this ever again, but I don't regret checking it out in the slightest. As filler goes, I'll give this a solid seven out of 10. Which brings us to the end of Dragon Ball, and so next, it's time for Z, which has just, I want to emphasize, so much filler. But yeah, all in all, Dragon Ball's filler was... it was odd. It's certainly not without its fun episodes or moments, but it very much felt to me that Toei was really still finding their footing in the world of standalone filler episodes for Dragon Ball. And even outside of the standalone filler episodes, there's a whole host of filler storylines and cutaways in early Dragon Ball that I didn't touch on in this video. And they really weren't afraid to just invent things that are sure to be contradicted down the line. They were really fearless and not always for the better, but at the very least, the further I got into these filler episodes, the quality curves seem to continue improving. Better placed episodes, more cohesion, the whole nine yards. Next week, we will see if that improvement continued. But until then, thanks for watching. I'm gonna lie down now.